Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. This one brought to you by Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com. Go there and get your subscription. It's a now a subscription service. You just can stream all this great content, hundreds and hundreds of college courses taught by uh, professors that are the you know best in their field at uh, teaching the subject. They have a studio. I've done two of these courses. You go back to their offices and you spend days recording these in a professional studio. They're very, very well done, fact-checked uh, and edited and really cleaned up. The, the audio and video content is fabulous. And, um, and they just have so many different uh, options to choose from. Here's one that I'll tell you about. The Big Bang and Beyond, Exploring the Early Universe. That's cool. Uh, this is 12 lectures on everything related to the Big Bang and Beyond. The first few minutes of the universe, the first galaxies, first stars, and dark matter. How big was the Big Bang? Well, pretty big as I understand it. Well, pretty small actually, and then pretty big. <laughs> well, after inflation, the first fraction of a second, what caused the inflation? Uh, was there more than one Big Bang? Is there a multiverse? Anyway, this goes on and it's just fabulous. 12 lectures, check it out. So that's just one of just tons of uh, examples I could provide. Uh, this you can get access to through this show. Two years for the price of one. Two years for the price of one subscription. Uh, if you go through my show, wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash S-H-E-R-M-E-R. -E Why would you not do this? You got to do this. Just go right now before you listen to the show, hit pause, go to wondrium.com slash Shermer and just sign up. It's just a done deal. And then you have access to you just have the app on your phone and you just open it up and you just start scrolling and go, whoa, there we go for my drive today. I'm going to listen to this lecture. Actually, you can, for most commutes and, and, and uh, daily activities, I can get through a couple lectures. So it's pretty cool. All right. Check it out. OneDream.com slash Shermer. Two years for the price of one. All right. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Daniel Axt, is a writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Slate and other leading publications. He was a board member of the National Book Critics Circle and has taught at Bard College and in the Bard Prison Initiative. Ooh, I got to ask you about that. He lives in New York's Hudson Valley, which I've been to. I uh, love that area. Okay, welcome, Daniel. Nice to see you, and, and thanks for coming on to talk to us. And thanks so much for having me. The pleasure is mine. So um, before we get into the book, let me give a proper introduction to the book. It's called War by Other Means, uh, and the subtitle is The Pacifists of the Greatest Generation Who Revolutionized Resistance. I love the book. I, I love reading books that I know nothing about, and, the, uh, and this was a subject I knew pretty much nothing about. You know, and I'm just kind of one of those baby boomers who grew up thinking, well, that 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 was the greatest generation. That was the best war ever. If there's going to be a good war, that's a good war. Who could have possibly opposed that? I didn't know anything about the re resistance movement other than kind of a vague recollection of uh, um, Charles Lindbergh and the American Firsters. And we shouldn't yeah. get involved in any more European entanglement. But that's pretty much it. So but before we we get into your thesis and all that, just give us a little bit of background about uh, who you are, where you came from and how you got interested in this particular topic? Uh, you know, I've been a, a writer, a journalist my entire career. Um, I started focusing more on books. I, I published two novels, and this is my third or fourth nonfiction book. And, and I um, uh, I have taught as at Berkeley and Bard here and there. Uh, I got interested in this in part because Adam Hochschild wrote a wonderful book about World War I and opposition to it. I think it was called... Um, the War to End All Wars, which, of course, is an ironic title. And I wondered, you know, I never read anything about World War II in this connection, and I never read anything about it with, with, with respect to the United States. Adam's focus was Britain. Um, and so I started reading uh, more about this, and I grew increasingly fascinated because, like you, I didn't know anything about it. I had no idea there was so much material right up until the end. I was astonished at the uh, amount of material there was to cover and had to make some hard choices. And so, um, you know, I, I try to, I, I go, I try to run in the opposite direction of the crowd. There, there are just plenty of people, people writing biographies of Lincoln and so on. Lincoln was a great president, but, you know, I try to do something that's a little different. It's what interests me. And I hope, uh, I hope it can find readers who are interested as well. 
<laughs> yeah, we don't need a, a 987th biography of Ab Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> but what else is more there to say? Yeah. 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 So I was thinking about this, uh, the, this thing called the curse of knowledge. That is when you know something that somebody else doesn't know and it's hard not to know it. And so it's hard to explain things to people when you, you understand it and they don't and so forth. And, um, and I was thinking about this with World War II because after the fact, so the hindsight bias, curse of knowledge, we know what happened. We know the Nazis, they were the baddies and that, you know, it was, it was good to, to do what we did and so on. But, you know, I'm reading your book, I'm thinking, you know, if, if it was 1939, 1940 and it wasn't clear who the bad guys were and then, uh, and then Hitler turns on Stalin and then, and, and also Stalin had already invaded Poland Right. It, you know, which side should we be? It, it isn't obvious, I guess, if you lived at that moment. Uh, in fact, one of the things I try to do in the first part of the book is take us back to a time when the events that we now regard as uh, predetermined and obvious and so on are very murky, just like the events of our own time. People are groping around. They, they're not sure who the enemy is. They're not sure what to do. And and I, I, I try to take us back to that time and um, a lot of the book, in fact, is set before Pearl Harbor precisely because uh, there was uncertainty and because there, there was such a massive American pacifist movement at that time. Uh, all of that said, I, I should add that, um, uh, you know, it, 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 when, I, when I first conceived this book in my head, the title, that is the title I had in my head, was um, The Great Mistake. Um, because I did not then, and I do not now believe there was any alternative to fighting that war. Um, all of that said, um, there are extraordinary things that flowed from the great mistake of these um, very uh, moral and uh, these individuals who, who were um, uh, insistent upon conscience at that time and refused to kill uh, and, and that's really why I focused on them, because of, of, of where it would lead eventually, which is to us today. Right. So these resistors and the American firsters and so forth in the late 30s, they're really following on the First World War, where it wasn't clear that this was a good war for us to be in, I guess. And, you know, who really started it anyway? You know, it start, all started with this assassination of Franz Ferdinand and all that. And then why why did we get involved? And you know, millions and millions died. And to make the world safe for democracy, except you know, we, we didn't really sign off on the, uh, the on the League of Nations and all that stuff, or the United Nations later. And it's I don't know. Maybe there was legitimate concern in the 30s in America. We don't need another American involvement in a European entanglement. Well, that's absolutely right. In fact, remember it was called the Great War at that time. It was mm. unique. It wasn't the first world war because there had not been a second one. And so the great war rather soon came to be seen as a waste and a sham, but in fact, a scam. Uh, there were hearings before Congress about how the munitions makers uh, made out like bandits and um, the depression had come, the Spanish flu had come, the Russian revolution had come and people blamed all of it for one reason or another on the great war. Uh, and as the as the twenty and the thirties wore on, it became clearer and clearer that there was more trouble brewing in Europe. And so, what had been sold to us as the war to end all wars, in fact, was just coming round again just just two decades later. Uh, and it's important to understand the landscape at that time. There was a vast anti-war movement on American campuses among the young. Uh, the the movement involved a lot of women, in particular. You know, there had been women's suffrage, and uh, 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 even then women were, were moving toward greater um, uh, opportunities in life. And um, there was this massive anti-war movement, and much of it was on the left, you know, particularly among the young. But as you point out, there was another side of it, which I only talk about briefly for want of space in my book, which were the people that, for want of a better word, uh, were called and will call isolationists. You might call them anti-interventionists. They were much a much more complex group than than people seem to realize today. They are, um, the, you know, America first started as a progressive student movement at Yale. I mean, there were people like 
Potter Stewart and Sergeant Shriver and Kingman Brewster, who was later the liberal president of Yale, who were among the founders of America First. In fact, they labored to keep out fascists and you know, neo-Nazis and all these kinds, Jew haters, all these kinds of people who unfortunately were drawn to it, you know, magnetically. But um, and in fact, the, 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 the isolationist idea was to stay out of war, but stay strong in order to do so in a way uh, th th that's the standard view that Americans have today. You know, the pacifists were the true radicals, and most of them, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, um, completely it, 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 it did a complete about face. They joined the armed forces. They supported the war. There was a, a relatively small number who stuck with their pacifism for uh, reasons we might say both deontological and consequential, uh, uh, if there is a distinction. Um, uh, for those reasons, they, they, they stuck, I don't want to say they stuck to their guns, but they, <laughs> they, they stuck to their doves perhaps, but they, um, they refused to support the war and the decisions they made and the actions they took and the things they learned and the ways they changed were all incredibly important for how America would evolve and how the American left would evolve and what, and what our society would look like today. And that, that's really the the main the main point of the book is not to not to valorize a refusal to defend our country, which I think was indispensable. Uh, unfortunately, was inevitable. But rather to to look at the um, impact this little group had. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And we'll get into the details of that in just a moment. Yeah. I had uh, the political scientist John Mueller on the show last year. He's written a number of books on on this. Uh, the stupidity of war, as he calls it, really yeah. in American history, he thinks there's only been three good wars, the Revolutionary War for independence, Civil War to end slavery, and then World War II to end fascism. But but your point is that it, that wasn't clear, say, in 1939, that we that there was going to be, well, let's say 38, there's going to be a second world war and we have to fight it and so on. Um, and the rest of it is just really, what are we doing, <laughs> you know, in the Spanish American war and, you know, and uh, all these other Korean war, Vietnam war, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, you just, the list yeah. just goes on and on. What's the point of it? Uh, you, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, so if we go back for a moment, you, you're raising the questions that they raised and would raise. And, and, and if we go back for a moment, they, they raised uncomfortable questions, and it wasn't just the pacifists, by the way. These were raised on the floor of Congress. For example, why was it, why was it okay for Britain to occupy India or France to conquer North Africa and Indochina and, 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 and um, the Netherlands to rule over um, the Dutch West Indies, uh, or, or was it East, East Indies, I guess, and, um, and, uh, um, and yet not okay for... Germany to invade France and Italy to invade Ethiopia. Um, we, uh, you know, as you pointed out, uh, Stalin and Hitler for a while divided Europe between them. And, and you know, Stalin invaded Poland too, from the other side. Right. He also invaded <laughs> right. the Baltic countries. They fought two wars against the Finns. The Finns, the, the, at one point, the Finns found themselves fighting in, a, in effect on the side of the Nazis. And there's a fascinating paper. There were Jewish officers in the Finnish army at that time, and they found themselves having to interact and coordinate in this capacity. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So it's it, we, we all think of this stuff as, as, as settled, but if you go back then, nothing was settled. And, um, and the other thing I would just add hastily to your uh, last point, it was that, honestly, if you had behaved as a pacifist toward almost every American war or military intervention, um, since um, the Second World War, maybe you could justify Korea, you know, uh, then you would be right. I mean, if you just had a knee-jerk response of saying, whatever it is, whatever, wherever we're fighting, I'm against it, ultimately, you probably, history would have, have borne you out on that, on that point. Yeah, so, I just thought of uh, an incident I wrote about in a previous book um, on... Uh, the 1919 case of Schenck versus the United States when Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes made his famous clear and present danger about shouting fire in a falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater that speech can lead to violence and so on. Who who were this? Who was Schenck? Well, this was Charles Schenck and Elizabeth Baer, members of the executive committee of the Socialist Party in, in Philadelphia, and they were equating the draft conscription to slavery, and it's a violation of the 14th Amendment. 
Here is what they wrote. A conscript is little better than a convict. He is deprived of his liberty and of his right to think and act as a free man. A conscripted citizen is forced to surrender his right as a citizen and become a subject. He is forced into involuntary servitude. He is deprived of the protection given him by the Constitution of the United States. He is deprived of all freedom of conscience and being forced to kill against his will. You know, it's like that's that's a pretty reasonable argument, actually, especially right there in, in 1919, well, 1980. So this is post right after this First World War. And if you think about it, the government is saying we can own your body and and direct you what we want for some period of time. And, and here's and that's what's astonishing. remarkable. <laughs> that's right. And here's what's remarkable. OK, the, the pacifists made and particularly Dorothy Day made the same argument testifying before Congress against the nation's first peacetime draft in 1940. It was passed anyway, but she made the same argument. So did other pacifists. So did some of the isolationists make a similar argument. And some years later, a gentleman named Milton Friedman, the well-known <laughs> economist from the right. University of Chicago, went before Congress, made the same argument. And um, uh, uh, and, and uh, a, a general, I believe, uh, asked him, uh, you would have our country defended um, uh, by mercenaries, to which Friedman said, well, that's better than slaves. So um, this is this is as old. This, this goes all the way back, even before the Constitution. You know, and uh, we people don't realize it's a much more complex story. I mean, my my pacifists were not uh, doctrinaire leftists in the modern sense. They were, in fact, libertarians to a great extent, and that's why you see this overlap on between the two, what we now might see as the two sides, which is a silly way I'm supposed to look at it. But they were libertarians. They were verging on anarchists. And, and to them, the government was not the source of largesse and justice and so on. The government was a source of tyranny and militarism. Let me read your epigram for the book We uh, from uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. We who allow ourselves to become engaged in war need this testimony of the absolutist against us, lest we accept the warfare of the world as normative, lest we become callous to the horror of war, and lest we forget the ambiguity of our own actions and motives and risk, and the risk we run of achieving no permanent good from this momentary anarchy in which we are involved. <laughs> That's a, a powerful line. statement. Yeah. When, when did he write that? Was that the 1930s? I... I, I think so, but I, I don't recall. I'm sorry. There's a lot of detail in the book, and I wish I could put my finger, because yeah, it would yeah, matter, yeah. I guess, and I'm, <laughs> I'm embarrassed that I can't answer that accurately. I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. It's no, but, uh, but I uh, yeah, uh, and I was thinking of another one um, that I pulled back from, pulled out from Gustav Gilbert's book, Nuremberg Diary, in which he's interviewing Hermann Goering. This would be 1946, I guess. And wow. then, so <laughs> later in the conversation, Gilbert recorded Goering's observations that the common people can always be manipulated into supporting and fighting wars by their political leaders. We got around to the subject of war again, and I said that contrary to his attitude, I did not think that the common people are very thankful for leaders who bring them war and destruction. And then Goering says, why, of course the people don't want war. Why would some poor slob on a farm want to risk his life in a war when the best he can get out of it is to come back to his farm in one piece. Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia, nor in England, nor in America, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood, but after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy. And it's always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy, a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. And then Gustav says, well, there is one difference, I pointed out. In a democracy, the people have some say in the matter, to their elected representatives. And in the United States, only Congress can declare war. Gehring then responds, oh, all that is all well and good, but voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. It's easy. All you have to do is tell them they're being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. That's astonishing. Right. Now, I would, I would note, by the way, that Really, the rich, the, the the pacifist tradition that we speak of here is largely an Anglophone thing. I mean, it does exist in some other countries, but uh, and in fact, Britain during World War II was incredibly liberal toward its pacifists. Um, and um, uh, you know, I think that um, the, the, he, he, the, the, 
before Pearl Harbor, there's a reason we were not more involved in the war. And the reason is that Roosevelt understood the American electorate and people didn't want it, weren't ready for it. And, and in fact, we were out of it. We gradually got in step by step until we were we were fighting an undeclared naval war in the Atlantic. But, you know, um, it, it, uh, unfortunately, pacifists have not succeeded in abolishing war, but um, uh, it's, it is useful, as, as Niebuhr says, to have someone to, to, to point out these issues. Right. So, uh, and these people, I mean, we think of pacifists and war protesters, uh, back to say, harken back to the Vietnam War, long-haired, radical, hippie, atheist, liberal <laughs> types. But those aren't the people that you're talking about here. And so talk a little bit about like the new left, the old left, how leftism, liberalism has changed uh, over the course of uh, of the 20th century. And Sure. And, and, sure. Yeah. You know, and in fact, so much of this, really the pivot is, to me, the pivot is the war and, and, the, and the behavior of the pacifists, the identity of the pacifists and how of the pacifists and how they evolved, you know, uh, when you, when you, the, before David Dellinger now is famous to a young generation from a movie which portrays the Chicago Seven, right? Mm. Of course, you and I remember the original Chicago Seven probably. Uh, but long before the Chicago Seven, there was something called the Union Eight. And those were eight students at the Union Theological Seminary in New York, a, a, an eminent liberal Protestant institution. And David Dellinger was one of those eight. And those young men, refused to register for the nation's first peacetime draft in 1940. And uh, they, even though there was an exemption created or a deferment for people just like them, seminarians, they would not cooperate even to the extent of filling out the card. Okay, leaving aside the issue of vanity, um, what the reason I'm, I, I get into this right now is because, you know, when they're portrayed, when they went to court to be sentenced, they were wearing, they were wearing their best suits, their hair was carefully combed, their shoes were shined. And you know, that's the way more or less they went about most of the time. They didn't wear t-shirts that said strange or profane things on them. I mean, and all of the young men in my book, when I was doing some research, we ended up not having photos. The people like Kingman Brewster in college, they, they called themselves men and they looked like grown men, you know, and in some respects they acted like it. You know, I mean, it's an incredible difference. I have young sons who referred to when they were even in college, that you know, kids. You know, well, these these guys all call themselves men, and they were men. In any case, um, so uh, when they got involved, the, look, pacifism at that time, uh, like all great American reform movements, was religiously motivated. The great driver was liberal Protestantism. Most of the key figures in my book had come up through that in one way or another, and I'm, a defi I'm, I, I'm defining it broadly. We can encompass the Quakers, but just the Methodist youth movements of the 30s. So they, they had a spiritual basis. They had not just spiritual, but a religious basis, and the draft law required for you to be certified as a conscientious objector. You had to have a religious basis, and it had to be rooted in a, in a, a peace church, essentially. So it became difficult for Jews and Catholics to become certified as COs, and there were efforts to sort of justify doctrinally the, 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 a CO claim by a, a, a non-Protestant. So in any case, they were um, uh, 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 the sons of the uh, middle and upper classes, often uh, sons of or grandsons of missionaries. Um, they um, were educated. They were older on average. They were uh, more literate on average. And so here, you right, right away, you start to see a distinction between the working class, as there always has been, I guess, and this sort of elite on the left, you know? So, okay, going forward, uh, after Pearl Harbor, um, Americans supported the war. And uh, the war economy was already in full uh, flower, if I can use such a term, uh, by the time of Pearl Harbor and certainly afterwards, and, and so the working class after the Depression had good jobs, they paid well, and then after Pearl Harbor, their sons were overseas fighting in a war they supported for, uh, uh, in the name of a government they supported. Uh, and so America's pacifists who held on after Pearl Harbor, there were about 43,000 certified as COs, but there were many more. There were women, there were older people, there were some who didn't get certified. And then my focus, which was really a couple thousand radical pacifists who 
mostly went to prison. Some thousands more went to these work camps run by the peace churches. Um, in any case, um, they recognized and the leaders recognized that the, we, they were going to have no success deterring America from fighting this war. Uh, as a result of their a little squeaking efforts, there was not going to be any laying down of arms. You know, in fact, many of the pacifists, as I, I may have said already, uh, gave up. Even even Einstein, even Bertrand Russell, who were fervent pacifists, said, no, nope, in this case, you got to fight. So so America's pacifists at this point said, you know, um, there's just no point in this. And furthermore, we might invite government repression. The government was reasonably liberal about many things in, in this arena at that time. And so they turned their attention to what they recognized as America's moral Achilles heel, which was the treatment of black Americans. And so here already we start to see a shift from economic issues, from industrial labor, from redistribution on the left to issues of, of, of civil rights, and in particular of race and uh, marginalized groups and so forth that would, would in, become increasingly predominant as the decades wore on. They didn't lose their anti-militarism by any means. It just went into a kind of abeyance. And similarly, these, these young men were imprisoned. They, were, they, were, uh, they went off to these uh, civilian public service camps run by the peace churches, and these places were hotbeds of radicalism. And the religious pacifists were thrown in with the more secular socialist pacifists. There were even a few Jews who were pacifists, which I give some special attention in the book. It's a particularly fascinating group. Um, and the result of all of this was a gradual secularization that I think set in already. For example, by the end of the war, the, the religious, all the pacifists resented the peace churches for running these civilian public service camps. They said, you guys are in bed with the government. You're not really running the camps. It's the, it's the government. In fact, it's the United States Armed Forces that are running these camps. They really ultimately call the shots. And so you see the secularization, the growing secularization of the American left right here. You know, David Dellinger, all his life was a spiritual person, but he went from being a seminary student, intended, headed for the ministry, to being a militant radical and um, and he never really went back to uh, the Protestant or any any other church uh, after after the war. He he remained during the war somewhat active. So you start to see all of these elements, and I could go on and on. I don't want to prevent you from asking further questions, but I oh, could no, do it's all right. All. Keep going. <laughs> just, <laughs> this is no, great. Just, just staying with this. Um, um, I focus on these four individuals. One of them was Dwight McDonald, who was uh, I know I, I know you are aware a cantankerous. Uh, and somewhat uh, chameleon intellectual, a brilliant and witty guy, and along with Dorothy Day, someone that I call, and I think they they call themselves, you know, conservative anarchists. It may have been uh, Dwight's biographer, but any anyway, conservative anarchists. I mean, Dwight later would practically make a career of defending high culture. Dorothy Day loved Dostoevsky and opera and so forth. Um, these were not these were, the people have no conception. I mean, these were not shallow. Anyway, um, Dwight started a little magazine called Politics. I believe he was exempt from the draft for health reasons. He had asthma, he smoked, whatever. Um, and Politics only had about a 5,000 circulation monthly, used his wife's money. But um, it had readers like the young uh, Noam Chomsky, you know, mm. or my wow. great friend Nicholas von Hoffman who became a community organizer before he became a famous columnist for the Washington Post and so on. Uh, he worked, uh, Nick worked with Saul Alinsky in Chicago. And, and so Dwight had an incredible list of contributors. It's just a who's who of, of original thinkers of the, of the second half of the 20th century. And, he, and I say in the book, it, the magazine, the journal featured what you might call headlines from the future. I mean, they, they had a, a passionate article, a, a very powerful article by a young man who was, we would say now, gay. And it was about why homosexuals ought to be treated as humans, you know? And they had another uh, couple of pieces, I believe it was, by um, a young woman who, um, I think she was young, who, who wrote about the importance of women uh, working outside the home and how for this to happen, men would have to take up more of the role of, uh, caring for children and and so forth, that uh, you know more of the the caring for the house, uh, and these were not uh, widely discussed ideas. 
in the early 1940s. I mean, it's hard to convey, again, to Americans today how far out this is. McDonald, throughout in his journal, argued for a, a integration of the armed forces and, and everything else. I mean, so uh, all of these folks turn strongly to, to issues like that. And, and they also, as Reinhold Niebuhr suggests, um, they served a crucially important, I think, role in, help, in, in trying to prevent us from turning into our enemies, which is one of the terrible things that happens in a, in a life or death struggle. Uh, you see it happening in the political landscape today. And they, they called the nation to conscience. They didn't necessarily succeed in preventing things, but they at least let us know that, uh, they reminded us that it was wrong because we knew it was wrong, I suspect. So they said, we shouldn't round up the Japanese on the West Coast and put them in dusty, far-flung camps in the interior. They said, the Jews are facing an imminent catastrophe in Europe mass killing is occurring in Europe. We need to admit more Jews. We need to at least admit the, the, at least fill the quotas that we have. We need to expand the quotas. We need to save these people. They said we should even consider an armistice of some kind. We might save a couple million on that basis. Think of it. They actually said these things. And by the way, when the mainstream press was suppressing the news of the Holocaust, they were talking about it. They were brooding it. They were raising the alarms. They hated the Nazis, incidentally. American pacifists before the war absolutely loathed the Nazis and, and, uh, and tyranny of all kinds. Um, and so, and they said, we should not bomb civilians. You know, Guernica, uh, the, uh, uh, Picasso's painting is about the bombing of civilians in the Spanish Civil War. I mean, the, 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 one of the worst things our enemies were, 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 uh, had done was to bomb civilians. And then when the tide of war turned, we bombed civilians. And uh, pacifists said, you shouldn't do that, it's horrible. And when we used atomic weapons on Japan, they reacted in absolute horror at a time when Americans overwhelmingly supported the use of atomic weapons. And uh, by the way, I don't pretend that's a simple subject. When I, one of my writing classes, I gave the students an essay, I think it was Dorothy Day's essay about Hiroshima, and an essay by Paul Fussell, uh, who was an infantryman uh, in Europe and was then being shipped out to the Pacific for the invasion of Japan. And, and the, the head, it was a new, famous New Republic essay. You probably know it. Thank God for the atom bomb. Mm -hmm. I yeah. wanted my students, my father-in-law felt that he would not be alive if it had not been right. for the atom bomb. Right. You could go back and forth. I don't justify any of this. I'm, I'm not here to... to the, the point of the book is to help people to see what happened and how complex these things were, and how good people could differ. And um, so uh, getting back to the point of your question, which I've, I've, I've smothered by now in verbiage, um, the, um, these individuals had this remarkable impact later on on the movement against the Vietnam War, on the civil rights movement. Bayard Rustin is another of my central figures. Rustin was an amazing man, one of the most extraordinary figures you will ever read about. And a, a, just a brilliant autodidact. And he was a Quaker. He went to prison. He, he refused to fight. And he wouldn't have fought anyway in a segregated army. He wouldn't have served in a segregated peacetime army. He rejected discrimination. He was black. Uh, the young may not be aware of that. He was, In fact, his writings were published in a book called Time on Two Crosses because he was black and he was gay. And these were difficult to see in the early 1940s when Gunnar Myrtle's book, An American Dilemma, uh, pointed out that most Americans seemed to know that the treatment of blacks was wrong. They were, they were sheepish about it. But anyway, Rustin um, later was crucial in, in, in helping Martin Luther King to see and helping the entire civil rights movement adhere to rigorous nonviolence. He said, this is the only right way, and this is also the best and most efficacious way. And I think history bears him out on that. He was an amazing man. Uh, and so uh, nobody really seemed to understand that, seems to understand that all of this comes from the, the pacifists of World War II. And so that's sort of uh, what the book is about. I love that. That's a, that's a, that's a perfect uh, quick summary of the book. So uh, let's get into details. Let me kind of reconstruct the timeline yeah. here. So before Pearl Harbor, 
uh, the isolationist movement, pacifist movement, uh, and, and anti-war movement and so on was reasonably strong. Roosevelt would have liked to get involved earlier to help Churchill. And, uh, you know, he did the land lease and uh, yeah. the 50 destroyers, and he mm -hmm. did, did what he could do. I guess you're nudging up against what Congress will allow you to do, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I did not know there was a draft in 1940. So that was implemented anticipating that we were going to get involved at some point? Remember, uh, uh, September 1st, I guess it was, of 1939, was uh, the beginning of World War II. The United States was not in it. It was uh, a war between uh, Germany and um, uh, on one side and France and Britain on the other. And um, as, it was quiet for a while. Not much, you know, seemed to go on. But at some point, I think it was in early 1940 or, or the spring of 1940, British, I'm sorry, uh, German panzer units came crashing through the Ardennes forest, made an end run around the Maginot line, which turned out to be useless. And France collapsed in, in, in uh, just like, a, like the proverbial house of cards. And everybody, when, when this was happening, France had been considered to have the finest army in the world. And, 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 and when this was happening, uh, people in the United States were not ignorant. They weren't stupid. There were foreign correspondents for all the papers uh, when the Blitz happened in Britain, uh, you know, uh, uh, there there were correspondents, radio correspondents for the first time, broadcasting the sounds of it um, home. And, um, you know, uh, Edward R. Morrow um, and um, London is burning. And um, people knew what was going on. And so an effort bubbled up. It actually came from outside the administration, from the, the, the same Plattsburgers, these 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 uh, uh, waspy old uh, these 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 old kind of northeastern aristocrats who had trained officers upstate in upstate New York for World War One. They said, "Hey, we got to do something," and through their influence with Henry Stimson and so forth in the Secretary of War, they uh, legislation came about, uh, which the administration backed uh, to impose the nation's first peacetime draft. Incredibly controversial. Remember, this was a country that had never had peacetime conscription and World War I conscription, then called, again, the Great War, had been turned out to be a fraud. They had dragooned people pointlessly into this thing. This was how many people now felt, particularly the young who were the ones facing conscription. Um, and for what? And so uh, they managed to get it adopted. And uh, that's when the trouble really started, because you had to, if you were a young pacifist, pretty much you were now going to be faced with a decision. So yes, that was the that was the first peacetime draft. Oh, sidelight. Ultimately, the, after a little while, the head right he was the number two guy, but then the head of the Selective Service was um, uh, General Hershey. I think he was a colonel at first, and he was the same man who was the head of the General Lewis Blaine Hershey, the same man who was the head of the Selective Service during Vietnam. Oh wow. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And he wrestled in some ways with some of the same characters. It was Dellinger again, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, there's you all seen, of these amazing things. I just thought of this. Have you seen the remake of All Quiet on the Western Front that's been playing I have, on? I have not yet. Is it good? Oh, my God. It's unbelievable. It's just, oh, it's so, God. it's so visceral capturing the, just the utter stupidity of the whole thing. Of war in general, but the the, the so-called Great War in particular and it ends just horribly, you know, follows one character throughout the whole thing. And then he gets you, bayoneted in the final seconds of the film. And you, it's you, just... know, <laughs> you, you know, Michael, that uh, Lou Ayers, who was the star of the first All's Quiet oh, on right. the Western Front, was a pacifist. And so oh, he... Is that right? Oh, absolutely. I did not know that. Lou Ayers, the huh. uh, matinee idol, as they used to call them, Dr. Kildare. Uh, oh, if you remember right. those? Right. Yes. Yeah. Not the TV show, but the early, uh, you know, the movies. Dr. Kildare, uh, he was a pacifist. He was a vegetarian, a free thinker in various ways, very thoughtful guy. And he spent a little time in a civilian public service camp and finally agreed to go into the service and, and train as a medic, which he became. He, 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 did not, he was not directly in combat, but he was uh, in a theater of operations. And um, uh, so, yes, so that, so, you know, it kind of goes, uh, uh, goes around. I mean, I remember the original movie of Gallipoli, which was another of the great anti-war films, also also very tragic. Yeah. Yeah, John Mueller makes the point that before that, 
war was considered this kind of glorious manly thing yeah. that's great for nations and it's kind of social darwinism and he has tons of quotes pre-world war one quotes of you know people like teddy roosevelt you know this is the greatest thing a man can do and so on and, and it, of course it's always somebody else that goes to to die miserably uh while you know the people at home the leaders and generals are the ones that get all the glory and, uh, and, you know, but you after to... so the, so, so this kind of the st start of the whole you know war is really a stupid thing to do that really begins with post world war one all quiet on the western front and gallipoli and and the, even the Marx Brothers movies, uh, which one? Uh, it, it, I forget which one Duck was two? the anti-war. Duck Soup, Duck's yeah. Where, yeah. Where, where Groucho and, and the other guy are about to meet and Groucho has this whole thing in his head like, what if he insults me? And then, you know, then yeah. I can't put up with that. And then they have a whole yeah. scene after that where they fall into combat. And then, uh, let's see, there was The Great Dictator, of course, with um, Charlie Chaplin. And they have the two chair, the kind of barber chairs that they're ratcheting up and he's got the globe and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so I guess we're so used to that now, anti-war and, uh, you know, but but that was pretty new uh, in uh, the early yeah. 20th century. It, 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 yes, it was, although there are long roots to uh, North American pacifism. And I, I personally think that the big change, as in so many walks of life, the thing lurking that changes everything that we tend to overlook is technology. Uh, the, starting with the American Civil War, killing power, uh, industrial production, the, the raising not just of armies, but of mass armies, um, uh, uh, changed things. In fact, this is noteworthy. You know, in the Catholic tradition, there, there's this idea of a just war. You know, I think uh, Aquinas wrote about this, and there were some one or more papal, papal encyclicals. A just war had certain characteristics. And one of the things that the, the Catholic pacifists associated with Dorothy Day argued was technology had so increased the destructive, the killing power of modern militaries that there could no longer be a just war. There was, it was no longer possible, for example, to shelter civilians from a war. Uh, the, 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 the destructive power of modern weaponry. These were not just swords. These were not just knights or samurai who are professional soldiers. This was every farm boy and, and, every, and every farm girl whose farm might be overrun. Uh, and so, so there was the argument, some of which I think played out in the pages of The Catholic Worker, that, that you couldn't any longer have a, a just war. And I think that um, now we've come around. The United States doesn't have conscription. And, and it's in one reason maybe people have gone along supporting certain military adventures. We have a professional army, you know, and well, okay, they, you know, this is what they signed up for, you know. So I think that, um, in, in fact, I think when you look at, if you look at history, I think we've, we've had mass conflict is diminished, you know, in recent decades compared with, what I was describing earlier, whether it was the Civil War, or Great War, and so on. So all of that said, there was passive, there, were, there were Americans who refused to fight as soon as the Quakers got here. I mean, I'm talking like 17th century, and there was trouble over it. And even then, accommodations, 18th century American Revolution, accommodations had to be found, you know, when, in terms of militias, there had to be people who were exempted, people respected the Quakers. It quickly became clear you couldn't force them. You could you could threaten them with anything, many of them, and they just would not do it. So you might as well figure something out. And um, and we see those dilemmas even today when 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 laws on this subject have been liberalized throughout the Western world. It used to be you had to be against all war and you had to have a religious basis, right? Then it was like, well, just matter of conscience. Didn't have to be any particular church or religious basis. And then it became, well, it could be just this war, right? And so, so you see that um, the door has opened. Now we haven't had the kind of totalizing war that we've had in the past, but when Britain went through World War II, including being absolutely on the cliff edge of, of, of destruction, um, pacifists were defended, there was provision for them. It's, it's quite remarkable. And we didn't do too badly really either, honestly. So I, I pulled up the, some notes on that uh, Catholic Church's uh, just war theory. There's different versions of the kind of four major points, but here's one. The damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations must be lasting, grave, and certain. 
All other means of putting an end to it must have been shown to be impractical or ineffective. There must be a serious prospect of success. The use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. So here your your um, activists are pointing out that the destruction of Dresden and Hamburg and mass bombings or Tokyo, how is this different? You know, this is kind of a moral equivalency argument. Um, or now it's called whataboutism, but still it's a yeah. good point to make. Um, yeah. uh, you know, now, I, we, so, so here I guess, talk, talk a little bit about the difference between, say, a, a moral stance versus a practical stance. Like the argument would be, well, we had to do this to end the war, and ultimately yeah. the sooner we end the war, then the killing stops. So we didn't bomb Auschwitz uh, directly. Instead, we bombed the factory next to it, the IG Farben plant that's making ball bearings or whatever they're making. Try to end the war earlier. That was the argument. But but then you have the moralizing. Well, yeah, but how are we different if we're doing the same thing the Nazis are doing? Well, you know, you're you're the, the, you're absolutely right in, in that there were these two strains, just as there are these two strains generally sort of in, in, in philosophy, you know, I guess. This, I'm not a professional philosopher, but you know, the sense that there are certain principles you can't violate, you know. The ontological so ethics. Right, exactly. You know, maybe Kant, I guess. And, you know, okay, yeah. thou, thou, thou shalt not kill, right? Could be one of those from the Ten Commandments. Okay, goes way back. Thou shalt not, okay, fine. So some people would just say, you know what, that's it. When I, when I, I try to explain this to my students, so, okay. So then you have the other uh, strain, which is uh, utilitarian or consequential, and you might say, well, war is ineffective. Look, we just had the Great War and what did it get us? Nothing. We're right back and it's worse than ever. Or uh, we, we'll fight a war and it'll make us, it'll subject us to the same tyranny because we won't be able to win a war without turning the United States into a kind of uh, a dictatorial war machine. How else could we compete with our enemies in this new age of totalizing industrial war? These were the kinds of arguments, again, made by not just pacifists, but but by others who oppose the war, you know, and um, and people would, with respect to thou shalt not kill, people can dismiss it and say, well, you know, there was some, um, uh, you know, obviously uh, it was self defense and and people attacked us and so on and you know and and that's that's all true and so my, many pacifists tended to go back and forth. They made both arguments. They they often went with they they often raised uh, European colonialism as. Um, uh, as uh, uh, a factor, a moral factor to be reckoned with. Uh, and I, I think that most of them recognized the almost unique evil of Nazism uh, and um, uh, the threat of fascism. And that's why most of them changed their view, you know, after, uh, after Pearl Harbor. But, um, and, and you can't overlook... Uh, uh, people people sort of made up things. There's no other way to put it. There were these stories that would go around, you know, about defeating the aggressor through love or by holding up banners or something. The children of a supposedly the children of a Danish village had had flummoxed the Nazi invaders by by I don't know throwing flowers at them or refusing to move or something of that nature. There were compendiums of these things, and you know the, this the the, this, the tragic. Tragic. I, that's the wrong word. But I, I don't want to issue a characterization. But what I was going to say is that um, the Jews of Europe, meanwhile, had a tradition of nonviolence. They had no weapons. They had very little experience of organized violence. They had served in the armies of France and Hungary and every other country. Freud's three sons were lost for months. He had, they had fought in the Austrian army in combat. The Wittgenstein boys, all of these, they, they had the family had converted. But anyway, um, uh, but the Jews of Europe were systematically isolated and um, rounded up and slaughtered. And um, they practiced, for better or worse, and maybe they didn't have a choice, they practiced nonviolence. And uh, it was not successful. So, um, in fact, there are remarkable comments by Gandhi about um, uh, how they might have been even more generous with their blood uh, and um, uh, the truth is that pacifism, in, under such circumstances, well, no, pacifism can work uh, when you are confronted uh, 
with an enemy uh, who has a sense of his own decency. Uh, a free press, maybe a democratic tradition. A Gandhi had, uh, what was his name, Krishnalal, Gandhi had a sort of a right-hand man who wrote about these issues and said, look, we did this because it worked. You know, we, 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 we knew that it could work. British public opinion, you know, you have this, um, this sense of um, cognitive dissonance, I guess, that British, the British did not want to feel like horrible people. They had, an, they had this sense of British decency, fair play, and yet here they were not only ruling over people in India, but uh, beating them and, and shooting them and so forth. And, you know, it just couldn't last. And, and uh, uh, the civil rights movement in America, it's important to know that American civil rights leaders in the 1920s visited Gandhi to learn from him about the use of civil disobedience and nonviolence against a very similar persecutor, you know? And, uh, you know, and they came back with this knowledge and so did American pacifists, white pacifists uh, went to India particularly a lawyer named Richard Gregg wrote a book about it. It was very important. And so the civil rights movement in America did something very similar. Americans are decent people. That's my experience in, in uh, I'm not a young man anymore, and I believe that. And um, they uh, saw this stuff, and uh, the wrongness of it was apparent to all. It was apparent even before the civil rights movement, in most cases. Uh, and it uh, couldn't endure. And... Um, and so, um, so there were those two strains, you know, and uh, the the kind of rule based or deontological, the and the uh, utilitarian, and people went back and forth, and you know they bleed into one another. Sometimes it's hard to sort them out, uh, uh, have a clear demarcation. Um, um, but um, the, what it really boils down to, in some respects, is that some people, and I understand this, and I think you will too, some people cannot or will not kill. Uh, you know, and that's it. Uh, I don't know. I've never killed. I've never had to kill. I'm not a pacifist. Uh, and um, I like to, I tell you something, I would do anything for my family. So uh, I, I wouldn't put anything past me. So I, um, so I, I, I understand though, this feeling that uh, you cannot kill. I do, I do understand that, and I honor it. And I think we should all honor it. And and I think that the American pacifists of that period, while there was a certain amount of, uh, definitely of 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 sort of public disapprobation and 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 disrepute, and some of them the things were shouted, and the wives were sometimes uh, subject to some abuse. They um, there was a certain respect, especially afterwards, whereas the isolationist movement was destroyed. The, the, the idea of an anti-war movement on the right was virtually dead and a terrible tragedy in American history. We could have used that strong war voices on the right, you know, whereas the pacifists came through and they were people of principle. And, and, and even though World War II didn't change, the later wars did. And the later wars were more susceptible to, uh, to pacifist opposition, you know, if you see what I mean. Uh, and even aspects of the war that had been the good war, people started thinking, wait a second, Hiroshima, that was pretty bad. That was bad. Or the firebombings before Hiroshima. You know, remember the firebombings of Japan, even before nuclear weapons, uh, Dresden and so on. So, so the pacifists had a kind of moral standing. They had something that is often precious, I think, on the left, the sense of clean hands, you know, so that when, when it was time once again to oppose a war much more deserving of opposition, um, you had a group at hand who knew how to do it. They had done it before. Uh, and so uh, they came into their own, really, after long sort of doldrums in the 50s. They came, they came into their own later. Yeah. Yeah, just a couple of things I was thinking as you were speaking. Uh, I was writing about 9-11 truthism in my conspiracy book. And the 9-11 truthers have this um, idea that, you know, George W. Bush either uh, let it happen on purpose, 9-11, let it happen on purpose, lie hop, or made it happen on purpose, uh, my hop. And I was thinking about that with Roosevelt, you know, because after Pearl Harbor, there were conspiracy theories that he either, he, he wanted to galvanize the American people and, and Congress into going, getting into the war. The isolationism was strong. Pearl Harbor happens. It's, and that changed everything. So he must have know, known it. And there's, you know, there's memos that 
you can find after the fact, again, hindsight bias, you know, the Japanese are going to attack Hawaii and so on. Of course, yeah. that's leaving out the 10,000 other pieces of intel that yeah. you know, show they're going to attack the Philippines or the Aleutian Islands or whatever. And same thing with George W. Bush with 9-11. There was that uh, August 9th, 2001 memo from Condoleezza Rice, uh, Osama bin Laden to attack U.S. on U.S. soil. How come he didn't know about that? Well, again, 10,000 pieces of intel that yeah. Al Qaeda is doing this, that, and the other. Only in hindsight do we know that. So I coined a term called cow hop, capitalized on what happened on purpose. <laughs> yeah. That is, politicians are not that evil, but they, they are Machiavellian, like, well, we want to get into the war. We can't. Pearl Harbor happens. Thank you very much. All right. This happened. It was bad. But now we can implement the political uh, you know, policies we would like. Get, getting involved in the war, supporting Churchill in England, and so on. In the case of 9-11, that's the excuse to go into Afghanistan, and then, of course, Iraq, which was yeah. uh, never clear that that was the right one. And now, in hindsight, clearly yeah. they weren't involved. And yet, yeah. it, it seems pretty obvious in hindsight that this is what Bush kind of wanted to do all along, finish up yeah. maybe his father's uh, job. So capitalized on what happened on purpose. That's kind of real politics, right? Yeah. Now, I want to say that... Um... At, at, at one point, David Dellinger uh, repeated, uh, promulgated some of these kinds of ideas about Pearl Harbor. You know, there was a book, I think it was John Toland had a book about, you know, all of this. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, I think that there is, uh, you know, uh, when I worked at the LA Times, uh, there sometimes people would say to us, um, you know, oh, well, you're doing this for this reason and that reason. And so I had a, I had a colleague used to say, they have no conception. We're just not that organized. They can't even, <laughs> you didn't see the newsroom. It's just a complete slum. I mean, the idea that we coordinate anything of this nature is insane. We can barely get the paper out every day. It's a miracle. Inertia is so powerful. You can put out a giant paper every day by the seat of your pants. So all of that said, um, I, um, uh, you know, there was uh, a grasping. If you if you are committed to certain views and you're determined not to change them, there is a grasping. You know, for um, uh, for uh, conspiracy, for cause and effect. For there was it was it was it, you know in a way the past, many of those who uh, persisted in opposing American involvement in the war grasped at every failing of the Allies. They grasped at every at at, at every reason to oppose involvement. There was colonialism by the European powers, which, by the way, was ended by the war to a great extent, you know. Um, there was, that's not a justification, but Roosevelt certainly was against all of that. I mean, he hate, he didn't like that, to my knowledge. And uh, Roosevelt had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy. It's inconceivable to me that uh, he would have stood by and watched the legacy Navy, which he didn't see as legacy because he was there at that time. Uh, that he would let it be sunk, and and thousands of these men whom he commanded that, uh, or or their fathers, that he would let them go down in this way. It's all crazy. So uh, uh, all of that said, um, I do think that there was a kind of uh, motivated reasoning uh, on the part of uh, some of these guys. But you know, nobody's right about everything all the time, and uh, they were remarkably right later about a lot of things. They warned of a military industrial complex before Eisenhower gave it that name. You know, they said, we're going to be a permanently militarized state. Well, that's more or less what happened with a gigantic uh, armed footprint all around the world, bases in all these countries and so on, smaller war after smaller war. Uh, there was some truth to that. Uh, the nuclear arms race, uh, uh, these kinds of things did more or less flow from that. And then just the way that people were conditioned, the political culture was conditioned, the generation was conditioned by World War II to look at subsequent things through that prism. And you know the old saying, generals are always fighting the last war. Well, so are congressmen and, and presidents and, and uh, you know, dads at the dinner table. And um, uh, it, 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 it's not all that useful. So um, uh, you know, uh, the pacifists, I think, um, for better or worse, bequeathed us, uh, uh, at least on the left, a great suspicion of um, militarism and, and of government. It's odd today that in some respects, the left has so eagerly embraced government as the source of, um, of, um, of making things right, of justice and, uh, and, uh, and so on. When in fact, um, not just the pacifists, but their 
their uh, their descendants during the Vietnam anti-Vietnam movement and so on regarded the government as a source of militarism and surveillance, which it was. Most of these folks I'm talking about were under FBI surveillance for years and years, massive FBI files. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover for a while wanted, you know, recommended Dorothy Day's internment and so on, as I, as I recall, or if not her, one of one or two of the others, or eight or nine of the others, and um, you know, this was all a part of the a part of the landscape. So, so in fact, Dorothy Day was first arrested in a suffrage rally, you know, and because women didn't yet have the vote, and she did this just because a friend wanted her to, and when women did get the vote, she never cast a ballot. And she would never register a Catholic worker movement as a five as a um, 501c3 so that people could donate to it tax deductibly. That actually made it harder for the movement to raise money. It raised the cost of donating. And, and she said, well, I don't think that's the role of government. I don't want the government to do this. The government should not. We should never think the government relieves us of our individual responsibilities to one another. And... Um, and she understood that uh, that all of this kind of thing would just centralize more power. These were decentralized. They give the, the modern left the con the the consensus oriented decentralized nature of the modern left. The divorce of the working classes. You know, all of this kind of thing is um, the the suspicion of hierarchy. All of this is manifest among the pacifists, and it's it's in the left to this very day. Astonishing. Yeah, I was just thinking about that with, um, uh, well, back to the practical versus moral, the current, you know, right off the headlines, what should we do about Putin? And, you know, you have one faction saying, well, he did wrong. And unless he pulls out and leaves completely Ukraine intact, what it was, and then pays back for the damages, then then we're going to continue fighting versus those who say, well, why don't we just let him have the Donbass region promise that Ukraine will never be part of NATO just to stop the killing? And, you know, the other side, well, you can't do that because this is so evil. But, you know, so you get that moral versus practical. Very difficult. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't mean, know what they, the right answer is. <laughs> they bleed into each other because because in, in each in each instance, there's a there's a practical response to each of the moral arguments and a moral response to each of the practical ones, probably. So there are no yeah. easy there are no there are absolutely no easy answers. You know, the pacifists were very against the adoption of unconditional surrender as a war aim by the allies, oh, right. which I think happened at Casablanca. They said, what are you doing? Now there's no prospect of negotiating peace. We could save, who knows, the, the, a war on this scale. You know, if you could end it a month early, you would save a large number of lives, you know? You've now taken away any reason that the, the dictators of these countries might have to allow someone to negotiate a peace. You've, you've taken away any hope that the anti-war, whatever anti-war feeling there was in these countries could, could come to the fore. And they're just going to have to fight to, uh, to the bitter end. Uh, and the the opposite side of that was, well, we don't want to go through this again. We don't want countries dropping out, you know, individually, which they could do, right? Someone could make a separate piece. Good title for a novel. And um, <laughs> and so um, and so, you know, I I think that history of this kind gives you um, uh, a little more respect for the difficulties uh, that exist at all times. And uh, the difficulties faced by leaders like uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who had to cope with, uh, like somewhat analogously to Lincoln, had to cope with just an incredible array of, uh, of contrary forces, was buffeted by every possible practical and political and moral uh, and personal consideration. You know, it's just remarkable that we got through it all. So, mm -hmm. I always wondered about the idea of mass bombings of, say, German cities to bring the war to an end. We know that it didn't really slow the war machine. The Nazis got the factories up and running like the next day. And so, well, OK, so we're going to, uh, you know, kind of punish the citizen or get motivate the citizens to overthrow the regime. How do you overthrow a regime? I mean, the average guy has no power at all. Right. It, it's almost like, well, let, let's hope that Os uh, that uh, Saddam Hussein's people overthrow him. How, how do you overthrow a, a dictator? You know, I just was reading the other day, P Putin has like 50,000 private armed soldiers guarding him or whatever. And how do you get, you know, oh, just send Rambo in and take him out. Yeah. <laughs> Not possible. Right. So you bomb these poor German citizens uh, who never really supported the Nazi regime. Maybe they just kind of had to go along with it because everybody else did and all that. 
and there's no free press and they go to prison. They can see their neighbors going to sent to prisons if they if they speak out. Everybody keeps their head down, keeps their mouth shut and hope it ends. How is bombing them going to get anybody to do anything? Uh, same thing with the Japanese. Uh, you know, all you can do is hope that the the that that the emperor stops it, or that. But even he had resistance from the military uh, leaders in the country who didn't want to surrender, yeah. even after Hiroshima. I think I think after Nagasaki, they had they had to give uh, throw in the towel. But uh, uh, but even yeah. there, but the average Japanese citizen. I mean, Clint Eastwood's films on Iwo Jima and, and the other one he did you know, showed that they basically, they were forced at gunpoint to fight the Americans. They did, you know, on Iwo yeah. Jima, for example, that you have a choice. We're either, either the Americans are going to kill you or we're going to kill you if you don't fight the Americans. You know, <laughs> so, there, there are various yeah. arguments one one could make. Um, it, it's noteworthy that, that we did bomb the Japanese into submission. I mean, that that in fact is what happened. And with respect to Germany in particular and Britain, uh, we are talking about uh, democracies, say, in Britain that had themselves been bombed. Give it back to them, Mr. Churchill, right? And uh, it's difficult to say no. Your sons are fighting or maybe someone is dead. You know, they had something called Gold Star Mothers here in the United States. And um, uh, it's very difficult to say that uh, we're not going to give it back to them. They started it. And in addition, the hope may not be that the citizenry can somehow rise up. But the hope may be that a mili the military leadership, which also has has relative uh, sisters and and daughters in the factories and 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 so forth, uh, and property and so on, real recognizes through this means more than any other means that we have lost, we are defeated, and um, I, I don't justify it. I'm I'm simply I'm simply trying to. Um, oh, the other thing is that in those days, uh, bombing was just so inaccurate. Um, it was so dangerous that uh, we mostly, I think, in Europe did it at night, and uh, and we had a, a pretty good bomb site, but still, it was so inaccurate that it was not as effective as it would be today, where you can take out quite specific targets, and so you can have maybe a higher a higher moral uh, requirement and also a more effective, a practical side of of the bombing. Again, I, I make no justification. I don't know how in the world. I could say that I would have conducted such a war, and I think each of us should ask ourselves when we look back at this, uh, you know, how could we have done? Could we have done better? If I have two athletic sons, young men, highly educated, and um, uh, you know, I I don't I just can't imagine what it would be like every day to go through. Never mind finding myself in a foxhole. Uh, what it would be like to to think about to think about this very difficult problems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to your uh, your uh, activists uh, yeah. identification of the military industrial complex. I had Fred Kaplan on the show yeah. here. He has his book called The Bomb, and he points out that there is kind of a bureaucratic momentum to the Cold War and the arms race, in which not only were we competing against the Soviet Union, but each department, the Navy, Air Force, and Army, were competing against each other for budgets. Uh, to build more weapons, and then the more weapons you have, the more targets you need, and then the more targets you have, the more weapons you need, and you keep the budget going. And really, the arms race was was within as much as it was without, to the point where he pointed out there was like some site in Siberia that was not, uh, only not frozen like one month out of the year, where the Soviets had some, you know, just uh, outpost based. And then we had like 20 nuclear weapons targeted for this one little nothing place. Why? Because the the departments needed their budgets and they needed their weapons. It's just hey, astonishing. You know, and I, and I, I would add that, look, there's, there have become political imperatives. I, John Kennedy, did he not ran, one of the things he ran on was the supposed missile gap. There was supposedly yeah, right. a missile gap. The Russians were ahead of us or something. I don't believe that turned out to be true. But right. it was something that uh, people would worry about and maybe uh, vote on that basis. And the people worried about it, we had, that was only 15 years after the end of World War II. You know, right. this was not something to take lightly. Everyone had, the people had fought, they had lived through it. And um, uh, I would love to uh, see an end to all of this kind of thing in the world. We all would. And uh, I I just, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, if we ever will, and that's well. I mean, if it's it, uh, you, you cited uh, Eisenhower's final speech where he coined yeah. the term military industrial. If he can't stop it, 
Right. He's the president, <laughs> a former yeah. general. And so if he can't do anything about it, what's, what, what, yeah. what are you and I going to do about it? Other than agitating and kind of slowly reducing, say, the number of nuclear weapons and so on through all the different treaties and so on. It, I guess we're it, down to less than 10,000 now, maybe less than 7,500. And the, the paradox, of course, is that they kind of brought a certain peace, a, 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 a tense and uneasy peace, you know, a nervous a nervous splendor, a nervous peace. Um, and uh, because people, the weapons were so terrible and the standoff was so uh, uh, tense that uh, uh, people did what they could to avoid conflicts on this front. Each side knew that there was nothing to be gained except except uh, Armageddon, you know? So uh, I don't know if anyone predicted that. Linda Johnson, I think, said, you know, we're only postponing Armageddon. Um, it turned out Armageddon didn't come. And, and in fact, we were spared uh, many other, uh, maybe many other military deaths. I don't know. We had, we, we had options and um, we made some poor choices over the years, but here we are. Yeah, well, so mutual assured destruction so far yeah. has worked <laughs> so far. Uh, and Mr. Putin is r rattling his saber. Okay, maybe he's not going to do anything, hopefully. But still, it's not a long-term permanent solution. It'd be nice to have none. But, you know, even Obama, you know, when he said, okay, we're going to implement no, what was it? No first use, I think he said he was going to try to do. And and try, and try no launch on warning, because that's very dangerous. And And he couldn't do it. Right, because right. I think his NATO NATO allies said, "Hey, you, if you implement no first use, then what's going to stop Putin or whatever from using conventional weapons if we don't have that hanging over them?" And they don't want to spend an enormous percentage of GDP and have enormous numbers of soldiers under arms at all times in Europe. You know, that's not how. That's not what they want. They they would they you know realistically we substituted the nuclear threat for. You know, giants, giant standing armies, and and we didn't want them to. We didn't want the Germans to rearm, right? And everyone else was sort of bankrupt. I mean, the British certainly were bankrupt from the war and so forth. Difficult, these difficult problems. I, I, I sometimes, sometimes things happen, and they happen because there wasn't a lot of, <laughs> a lot of other ways that things could go. You know, I don't, I don't have answers on that. But uh, there was a need to defend Europe, and nobody wanted the the Germans to be a military power again. My God, we had been through that twice. So here right, we are. Right. What do you think your activists would say, looking back from 2022, how much progress we've made morally, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, yeah. you know, so forth, so forth. I mean, they, I mean, they I, were part of that. I, I absolutely think so. I mean, you know, the Congress on Ra of Racial Equality was founded by pacifists. James Farmer uh, uh, was in a hugely important uh, uh, movement in in bringing uh, sit-ins and and protest to the civil rights movement, nonviolent to the civil rights movement. So I think they would be I think they would be very impressed at at that. Um, they might they might recoil from the economic inequality they see. I would point out to them that that even the poor are richer than the middle class were in their day. I mean. The, um, the middle class is in, is enormously rich by any global or historical standard. Uh, uh, so yes, there are there are Musks and Bezoses and um, everybody else has a couple of cars. I mean, uh, I, so I think they would be impressed. I don't know what they would think about. Uh, I, I, they are dissidents, you know. They were compulsive. Dwight McDonald, Dorothy Day, absolutely compulsive dissidents. They were going to go their own way. Uh, or I, I think we now live. Uh, in, a, in, a, in an intellectual climate of extraordinary conformity uh, of a kind we have not seen in a long, long time. And I like to think that they would be horrified by that. Uh, you mean because I, of social uh, media? I, I can't put my finger on the causes. There's probably a variety of causes beyond the, 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 the term of this discussion or the length of our lives. But, um, you know, Harry Emerson Fosdick, I mean, there were celebrity preachers who went on the radio and preached pacifism, you know, between the wars. And Fosdick was doing the morning of Pearl Harbor. Fosdick was sitting down to do his weekly radio address in upper Manhattan to preach to preach pacifism, you know, and um, and people more, you know, more or less tolerated that. So so I think that they might recoil from uh the uh the turn that uh that things the turn toward conformity that that things that things have taken uh also they were uh, more a socialist uh than uh 
anybody really seems to be today. There's a few people who claim to be socialists and whatever, and they, it's really all, you know, I, I'm, there's not much, I think, there. Uh, the American Socialist Party was bigger. The war shattered, splintered that, too. They, they, the Socialist Party, Norman Thomas was the perennial presidential candidate. But our guys, you know, they were not, con they briefly, one or two of them flirted with uh, communism, but they, they didn't like communism for the same reasons they didn't like uh, militarism and tyranny. The, 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 they, the clanking rhetoric and, the, and the, 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 the egregious lies and the lack of, of freedom, they hated bigness, if anything. They would be disturbed by the concentration of power that has uh, been, again, promoted by technology. We all thought it was going to be liberating, right? And, and it turns out to have been is concentrated power in amazing ways. China is, of course, an exemplar of how government can use that uh, technological power to uh, implement an unbelievable Orwellian level of tyranny. And, uh, but here, here in America, in different ways, uh, tech, the digital revolution has, um, has concentrated power, economic power and political power. And um, it, it, there's a level of coercion. They were very wary of coercion. Even, even in nonviolent protest, they debated whether something would was coercive, you know what I mean? Like to sit down in a factory or something of that kind, you know, and they said, okay, well, it will be coercive in a nonviolent fashion, but the kind of, the kind of um, ambient coercion that is going on today uh, with respect to, uh, uh, or as a result of uh, the technological revolution, I think would be very striking and disturbing to them. I mean, obviously we'll, we'll never know, but uh, and there's always, of course, a tendency to ascribe, ascribe to them one's own uh, 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 fears and preferences. Uh, but all of that said, I, I find it hard to believe they would be comfortable in the kind of environment that prevails today on many campuses, for example. Mm. Right. Or these uh, recent news stories about the activists gluing themselves to paintings after they throw pea soup on it or whatever. I mean, Dorothy How is that Day supposed to bring about? Yeah. <laughs> Dorothy Day and Dwight McDonald, just they would be aghast. I mean, I think they would, their eyes would be rolling out of their heads. And by the way, Dorothy Day was arrested and in prison. I don't know how many times she was hauled off and she lived in poverty with rats and roaches. And she lived, she, she ministered to the very most uh, uh, needy, the very most difficult uh, set of Americans, uh, uh, alcoholic, uh, mentally lost in various ways, there was violence. There was there, it was a very difficult life that she led, and uh, the idea that we're going to bring about the revolution by uh, through uh, you know tomato soup on uh, on a on a work of <laughs> beauty a uh, is <laughs> yeah. uh, is just uh, I think would not would not be very impressive to her. You know, come in here and start chopping. We have a stew to make, and let, let's see if you can avoid someone throwing it at you. You know. That was uh, the Catholic worker movement. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that a little bit more, teasing out the different religious threads here, because the Catholic Church had the just war. Sometimes you have to fight bad people. Mm -hmm. uh, other religions had different positions. Jehovah Witnesses are just across the board. Uh, they're not going to fight. Uh, they're conscientious objectors. Then you had people like uh, Muhammad Ali. Oh, another good movie, uh, uh, I think two years ago on HBO, I think it was. I forget the title of it, but it was all about the Supreme Court, behind the scenes Supreme Court debates about whether Muhammad Ali should be allowed to be a conscientious objector oh. uh, with the Nation of Islam. And, you know, if we if we grant this, then what else, or, you know, who else is going to come forward and want this and so on? Really interesting, different threads there in different religions. How do you think about that? Uh, well, you know, uh, it's a fascinating subject to me because, again, from, from the modern perspective, and particularly on the left, there is such reflexive um, secularism. You know, religion just has almost no place in, in, uh, you know, in that world. And yet what people often don't seem to realize th is that they, they, they behave in some respects in a very <sighs> religious manner. And that, and that certainly, if nothing else, their the their movement their their political milieu is is significantly shaped by the uh, Protestant reformism of the past 
You know, there was something uh, more than 100 years ago called the social gospel movement. Walter Rauschenbusch and others were leaders of it, and they saw the conditions in the slums of New York and Chicago and other cities, and uh, they were Protestant, but they, but they said, you know, we, uh, we have to manifest Christ here on earth. And the way, the way to do that, the way to bring, to bring uh, the kingdom of God is to, is to help people, is to change the social conditions that are so horrible on the ground. And over time, you know, that part of American Protestantism grew to, to sort of con to, to subsume the spiritual dimensions, in my view. Church attendance in the mainline denominations has plummeted, you know, and, uh, and, but, and, and what there is in terms of ministers and seminaries and so on is it seems to be largely, significantly, if not largely, so social justice oriented. So, um, so religion has sort of trans has worked its way into the larger society in this in this form and and many aspects of that that you know you see on the the modern uh, modern left that strike me as as being religious in this in this manner the the the, the catholics catholic pacifism really uh, dorothy day was and was sort of opened the door to that uh we had later the berrigan brothers during the vietnam war and then then finally there were there were a few jewish pacifists during world war ii and that was kind of a particularly fraught position. Uh, there were, I, I forget the number, 500,000 American Jews served in the United States Armed Forces. Many thousands died. Uh, the, uh, the Nazis, even before Pearl Harbor, were known for their terrible persecutions of the Jews. And then it started to, what we now call the Holocaust, started to come out gradually and horribly. And, um, and, yet, and yet some Jews remained uh, pacifists. Max Campbellman was one. Uh, he was a, a young uh, young man from New York. Uh, uh, it later became famous as an arms negotiator in the Reagan administration. Uh, in fact, he later joined the Marine Corps Reserve. He decided he wasn't a pacifist anymore. But during World War II, he was a pacifist, and he volunteered for starvation experiments. Got down to nothing. It was an incredible ordeal for the men who participated. There's one other um, thing I will mention along those lines, by the way, if I haven't done so, um, which is the role that pacifists played in the nation's mental institutions. Uh, the, the male staff went off to work in uh, war industries for better pay, or some of them went into the armed forces. There was a tremendous need for uh, men to serve as staff in these institutions. The pacifists readily volunteered for this work. I think it was about 3,000 of them. Um, when they got there, they found this um, this Dickensian archipelago of custodial institutions where there was little or no treatment. Some were better than others, but but to a great extent, there was little or no treatment. The food was horrible. The, 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 they were just absolutely these dungeons of the mentally ill, and violence was used to control um, uh, the the men who were kept there, in part because there was so little staff. And the staff that they had were grossly unqualified. The pacifists came in and laid aside violence. They soon learned that they had to use force, restraining force at times, to, to save somebody either from someone else or from themselves, but, but that they could get by without the wanton violence that had been used. But not only that, they exposed the terrible conditions through local newspapers in Philadelphia, Poughkeepsie, and elsewhere, and fam most famously through Life magazine. And here we see, I think, the beginning of the American turn against these institutions, which would eventually be closed. These massive um, mental institutions are, for the most part, gone. Now, uh, we have other problems. Have we come up with anything to put in their place? Well, possibly not. So, um, um, but uh, these places were horrible, and the pacifists knew it. They made them better. They even published, they even published newsletters to tell one another about best practices that they had been developing. You know, uh, I mean, they were just absolutely remarkable. And 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 eventually, after these exposés and further years went by, of course. But I think you can see the roots of once once people knew how bad it was. It took time, but these places, these places were closed. So getting back to your your point about religion. Religion is very important in American history, and really only it's only recently that even the elites have 
divorce themselves from it. And we are a product. We are uh, historically a Christian nation, I suppose. These ideals shaped us. The pacifists called us to conscience in Christian terms, by and large. Uh, uh, and um, I think it's foolish for us to overlook that history or to fail it when looking in the mirror to see its marks mm. on ourselves. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a bit conflicted about that. I recognize the role of the Quakers in the um, abolition of slavery movement and other civil rights movements, or somebody like William Wilberforce uh, in England. But you know, they're the 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 people that were objecting to them that they had to push back against were mostly their own fellow Christians that that, well, that right. thought it was perfectly okay for slaves right. for slavery or uh, well, you know right. the segregation of blacks and things like that you know, even quoting biblical passages and so on. So it's not clear uh, what the driver of moral progress has been over, say, the last century, you know, just kind of, um, you know, expanding moral sphere or or moral circle, as Peter Singer calls it. Uh, you know, you get on that escalator of reason and it kind of takes you ever upward slowly with people agitating, making arguments for why this is wrong. Maybe their arguments are grounded ultimately in their own personal religious beliefs, but it's not enough to say we should do this because Jesus said so or whatever. You have to appeal to other people's r rational arguments for why somebody should not want to be enslaved. Like Lincoln said, as I would not want to be a slave, I would not want to be a slave owner. Right. Uh, he's just putting in, you know, interchangeable perspectives, how would I feel about it? You know, that's kind of a universal principle there. And uh, and you kind of see, you, you mentioned the cut there of social gospel Versus what the prosperity gospel or I mean, no, you almost see this, yeah, yeah, yeah just that the social gospel kind of subsuming the spiritual dimensions of mm. of traditional Protestantism. In other words, what matters are good deeds. Uh, it's almost like a movement to the Jewish tradition, right? What matters are the good deeds and making amends and all that, rather than uh, you know some uh, r rather than the the the, the, the uh, not that there was no spiritual element to the Jewish tradition, of course. So uh, with respect to um, all of them, after all, being Christians, I mean, that's true, but but the, the, but the um, but Christian doctrine was uh, heavily recruited in this direction. Um, men, men went to fight and die in part on this basis. In fact, if you go back to the abolitionist movement, a big problem with, with, for the Quakers was that they opposed slavery, but they also opposed war. You know, I mean, William Lloyd Garrison was a pacifist who opposed slavery, and he really lost uh, his a lot of his influence when he refused to endorse sort of our side, you know, the anti-slavery side, uh, in the war between the states uh, over um, uh, over slavery. So, um, so I think that, um, uh, and you look at the temperance movement and um, a number of these of these kinds of things. Uh, I, I guess you're right. People certainly on all sides have invoked uh, in wars. Everybody invokes God on on their side. But I think that uh, there is a Christian uh, context for a lot of this. And I do think there's a danger always if we rely on reason and solely reason. I wonder if there's a danger. You've talked about a moral escalator, but I wonder if it goes only in one direction. You know, I wonder if we take away the specialness of human beings or the idea that we're made in the image of God, whether things become possible that might not otherwise have been possible. And so I, I question the, the, the idea that it only goes in one direction, that direction is, is up. I wonder what's going to happen when there are, uh, when we're no longer preeminent on this earth, for example, in terms of intelligence, when there are beings, uh, maybe they'll call us carbs and they'll say, we, we have to stop claiming special <laughs> rights for ourselves, you know? I and mean, the AI uh, takes over. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, or what, or Peter Singer himself has, has been controversial with respect to some of his ideas about children and mm -hmm. handicapped children and so forth. Mm -hmm. Again, which, which become, uh, which become plausible assertions, at least I'm not criticizing, uh, Singer, uh, and, and, uh, on this basis, I'm just pointing out that, that, Certain things become plausible, you know, when your view of human beings changes. The pacifists in my book were kind of, like people called them personalists, you know, which is this kind of vague uh, a stew of, I, of, of Catholic uh, mysticism. And, and, um, but the, the, 
the main idea is just that that every human uh, is individual and has and has value, and you can't uh, they can't be used instrumentally, and uh, they should be exempt from uh, carnage, you know, and um, uh, and um, uh, so I, I I don't have I don't have answers on that. I think that for better or worse, the future does appear to be secular, but of course the future is very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. I've also noticed, again, back to the social gospel, you know, there are some Christians that, there was one faction of Christianity that says our job, like Jesus, is to take care of the poor, you know, man the soup kitchens, you know, provide social support, take care of the needy, you know, people fall through the cracks, that's what we should be doing. But then there's another faction, kind of the prosperity gospel, you know, God wants you to be rich, and also, when did Jesus become, a, you know, kind of a militant capitalist conservative, you know, let's invade other countries? <laughs> uh, you know, that seems quite contrary to a lot of the kind of religious-based activism you write about. Yeah, there's always, look, there's always going to be people who, uh, I mean, nobody, we don't, um, I don't know anybody in regular communication with a deity, and so we don't <laughs> actually know. We we have to decide right. for ourselves. Part of the, part of the, whole thrust of Protestantism, as I understand it, was that you had to read the Bible for yourself yeah. rather than simply responding to some given dogma that was handed down to you by a priesthood of some kind, you know, and, and, you, and, and that deeds mattered because there was no confession. So like the Jews, the Protestants had to kind of, you know, action is what mattered. You know, you shouldn't could just confess and say a few Hail Marys or something and go on go on your way. So um, uh, all of that all of that said, um, I, um, I I think that um, uh, there is a there is a prosperity gospel notwithstanding. I don't know a better force for doing good in the world than than prosperity. And um, I think um, uh, uh, something uh, we should not overlook is the extent to which so much of the world has been lifted out of poverty in the last in the last mm. thirty years. Uh, mm. I uh, I don't really see much to be gained from uh, I don't know somehow undoing that. I it's not yeah. I hope it would happen. Right. The only way to me the only way forward is forward. And then what do you think about the recent resurgence of Christian nationalism? Um, and nationalism in, in general, say, over the last five to ten years, versus, say, in the uh, 80s with Reagan and the moral majority and, um, you know, and that whole kind of politicization of religion. You know, your job is, in religion is to pick a side, you know, Democrat or Republican, and then compare that to, say, with the period of time you're writing about before the Second World War and immediately after. Uh, you know, I... Um... I think, first of all, it's a good opportunity for me to say that I consider my pacifists to be um, patriots in a way. Mm, I, yeah. I think that they love their country. And um, I personally, I'm, I'm with Richard Rorty. Um, uh, what is it called? Uh, Advancing Our Country. Is it a little book that Richard Rorty wrote in which he may, and by the way, he was a grandson or grandnephew of Walter Rauschenbusch, the social oh, wow. gospel uh, Maven right. and um, or social gospel uh, exemplar, um, and Rorty is a man of the left and realizing our country. I think it is, and he uh, made the point that without love of country, how can you, how can you achieve change? On what basis are you going? I mean, it's too easy to retreat into your enclaves on campus and wear you know the monochromatic uh, vestments of Bohemia, you know and dress in black and and all these badge these emblems of of cynicism or of belonging whichever however you want to put it and just ignore everything and sneer and, and snark and do all of those things um so he was not embarrassed about about that and i don't think that um that that that, that the pacifists uh were either there's something to be said said for nationalism just as there's something to be said for nations now i'm not a christian and i don't know about recruiting uh, uh, Christian people recruit Christianity for everything. I mean, you know, people people yeah. on people yeah. in baseball That's games true. look up to get before throwing <laughs> a, a three two slider, you know, in hopes that the guy won't hit it. So, I mean, I, there's always going to be true. appeals to yeah. a higher power. We, you know, we, we the, the the Hebrew National said that they um, 
appealed to a higher, they, they had to answer to a higher authority. If you remember the famous uh, hot dog ads, which mm. were so wonderful, you know, we, we answer <laughs> to a higher authority. So I, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't have answers on that, but um, I, I, let me say this. People seem to have a need for, for what I'm going to call, for want of a better term, religion. They have mm. a need to belong to a tribe. They have a need for um, a prefabricated doctrine. They have a need to feel that they are virtuous and that they have the backing of some, of some massive authority to protect them against their enemies and, and against the fates, because after all, we're all headed in the same direction. So, mm. so there is this need. And if you take away the things that we called you know, religion that, that had been maybe some of them tested by time, maybe they had certain virtues, it's all too easy to, to toss them overboard uh, before thinking about what you'll put in their place. Maybe something else rushes in to fill the vacuum. Maybe that thing is even worse. Hmm. Yeah, our next issue of Skeptic is on nationalism. And, and uh, yeah, the pro-nationalists uh, people make the point that you know, you have to have some kind of common language and set of beliefs that adhere us all together, that we're in this together. It's not just an extended family. It's something bigger than the family. Uh, here I was thinking of a couple of scenes from the Godfather movies. In the opening scene with Marlon Brando where the the um, undertaker comes to him yeah. for justice because yeah. his daughter has been brutally raped by these guys who were put on trial and let go. And the government did not give him justice, so he's coming to Don Corleone to get justice. And Don Corleone says, why didn't you come to me first? Yes. And In he fact, says, well, I, would... I wanted to be a good American, and I want to trust the government. He goes, I understand, but uh, yeah. if you had been my friend and you had come to me, there would already been justice. Then he has to go yeah. through and kiss his hand, call him godfather, ask to be his friend, and then justice is going to be done. Right. So there's your kind of family ties versus the larger national Ties. And then right. the closing scene of The Godfather 2 is where they kind of have a flashback where um, where Sonny is you know talking about the family or whatever. And Michael comes in and says this is right on the uh, after Pearl Harbor. And he says, I joined the military and, and his and his brother you know, basically slaps him upside the head. Are you out of your mind? Your allegiance yeah. is to the family, not the nation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, there's an important, I think, distinction we have to live with more than anyone, and we are kind of pioneers in some respects here in America. Obviously, lots of countries have different people in them, but, uh, you know, nation had a certain meaning. It was a group of people. Maybe nation, a nation might be Finland or Japan, you know. Nations of that kind are now sort of out of favor. They're in bad odor, strangely, you know. You're not supposed to to have or want a place of that kind. I think part of the part of Israel's problem is that it 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 was established as a Jewish homeland and 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 so by definition it fails uh, some people's modern ideas about what a country should be. It should be diverse and so forth. And so we have the challenge uh ever uh, uh, ever more urgently of forming uh, a polity uh of uh, forming a unity out of a, a vast and and diverse uh, group of people, ever more diverse group of people, uh, and um, and that is 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 going to be uh, uh, it, it's a great challenge already. And without some sense of a new being a new type of nation, being a nation, an elective nation, a nation of shared values, a nation of shared culture. Uh, to which everyone contributes, but nonetheless, a nation of shared culture. You know, without all of that, I, it does it. It is worrisome. You wonder how we think we're going to uh, manage to stick together and to become one e pluribus unum. You know, like they put on the money um, uh, from the many one. Uh, uh, you wonder how that will how that will happen uh, without. Um, uh, without some coming, without some coming together on some basis. So I don't think there's a lot of substitute for. Uh, and as I said, the, uh, nature abhors a vacuum in this area. And absent a religion, absent a nation, uh, other kinds of allegiances seem to absent a family. Increasingly, uh, you mentioned the Godfather. I mean, absent a family, uh, other kinds of allegiances uh, uh, will rush in to that vacuum. I fear, and we may not like them 
nearly as well as the ones we so eagerly threw over. Is there a, a totalitarian temptation in human nature where there, at least for a, a faction of people, there is an appeal to a strong man, a, 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 you know, a Putin, a Trump, a Erdogan, whatever. I mean, we've seen, again, a, a kind of a spike in this. And there's some percentage, non-trivial percentage of people that like that. Like, yeah, I want a strong person. Uh, of course. And look, I mean, we are creatures of evolution. And I suspect, you know, we evolved to have hierarchies. We evolved to revere strong, to revere or at least obey strong men. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I think that uh, all around the world, you see uh, some rapid cultural changes. And um, I think um, they are, a lot of people feel that they're unwelcome uh, and um, feel that they haven't voted for them. And uh, and so uh, we've seen this international phenomenon of of Trump and Putin and uh, Duterte and Bolsonaro and Netanyahu and so on, all and Xi Jinping and all of these figures around the world. It's remarkable all at once. How is it that it happens all at once? Any explanation that is not sort of global is maybe inadequate in some way, you know, and um, maybe it happens at times of fear. Maybe it happens at, uh, at, at times of, of uh, rapid uh, or unwelcome social change, maybe absent the family, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe in, with declining birth rates, or maybe these are factors. People feel that, they're van that, they're, that as a people, they're vanishing. I don't, I, I don't have answers. It's not something that I welcome, certainly. I, 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 I don't like anybody telling me what to do under any circumstances, honestly. And... Um, the last thing I want, and you know, again, part of the charm of these pacifists and and many of the isolationists also, uh, it almost almost crazily, they harked back to a decentralized America, a smaller a nation of smaller towns, of personal relations, of direct interaction, of people taking care of one another. They couldn't. They hated bigness, and uh, what what modernity has delivered and what technology has delivered is the opposite. You know. We have bigness. What matters is 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 what you know, not who you know, and and we think that that's good. And here we are. But maybe it maybe it leads us down the totalitarian path. I hope not. Yeah. Well, another story of of late. My wife is from Cologne, Germany, so we go back there periodically. And you recall when Angela Merkel opened up the borders to the Syrian refugees, and you know a million or more came. And, you know, that's still an issue. And, of course, you know, this is kind of they're not really German or they're not really Westerners or whatever. To what extent, you know, are you going to sign the guest book and kind of adhere to most of what we believe about women's rights and civil rights and so on? Anyway, so we uh, we were there a couple of weeks ago and, and I called an Uber to go someplace. And I always like to chat up with the Uber drivers. And he was a young man in his late 20s uh, with an accent. Where are you from? From Syria. Oh, my God. How long have you been here? About seven years. Oh, you must have been part of the ref. Yes, I came here and he told his whole story. You know, I was on this boat for that holds like 20 people. There was like 100 of us on this boat and it sank and I had to go back and start over. It took like six times to get to Europe. And, and I, I felt bad for the guy. It's like, oh, this is a heroic story. He got to come to the West. And but then, but then we got talking about something else. And Cologne is sort of like the gay capital of Europe. And uh, and that came up and he's like, oh, well, no, no, no. We can't have any of this gay lesbian thing, because if everybody became gay, then there'd be no more babies. And that would be the end of civilization, the end of humanity. <laughs> so my wife is, well, dude, are you becoming gay? And he's like, oh, no, not me. And she says, well, why don't you get started and make some babies then? He goes, well, I don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> I thought, well, that's a shocker. <laughs> right. So, you know, and, and you know, his argument, uh, you know, is grounded. He's he's Muslim and so on. And, you know, that you know, the, the whole kind of gay revolution has not come a lot of these Islamic countries yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there's another tension, you know, to, we, we want to be liberal, tolerant, open to new people. These are, yeah. you know, freedom seekers, the people coming from Central America to cross our borders. You know, why are conservatives treating them like criminals? These are people that want freedom. They want to work. They, they're like our people that first came to America. But yet there's a, a kind of thing, well, they're not really Westerners. They're not going to believe what we believe. So it doesn't feel like they belong here. Uh, Garrett Jones has a book uh, out right now. You should have him on. He would be very interesting, I think. He's a professor at George Mason. He has a book from Stanford University Press about uh, the tendency of immigrants to bring 
their own, uh, I think, political culture, and 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 that it persists when they go places. You know, that it's not just like okay, that boom, thirty years next generation, now they're American or now they're German or whatever it is. It's actually not that simple, or so he argues. I, I again, I have no, uh, I have no view of this. I haven't read his book, but uh, it's something that has. I've seen other sort of. Oh, ethnographic studies where people look back at what is the character of the Midwest, of the upper Midwest today, and how is it like Scandinavia and so forth. And uh, I would think that Garrett Jones would be um, a very interesting way for you to follow up this uh, whole question that you've raised, which we're only going to have to deal with more and more because, in fact, whatever the reasons, hardly anybody's having babies in these countries. And there's just going to be no way to prevent uh, uh, increased immigration and uh, to have very significant ethnic changes, ethnic and racial changes in these countries, for better or worse, and um, and that's the way it's going to be. So uh, it's just something that all everyone is going to have to find a way to cope with. Yeah, well, that's what's the basis of that great replacement conspiracy theory, right? Yeah. You know, look at the look at the birth rates that that. Well, the, uh, the amazing the, thing about that is the idea that the Jews are going to replace anybody, which <laughs> yes, is right. the most astounding thing in the world. That all twelve right. of us are going to come out somehow, <laughs> That's right. fill up the place. <laughs> it's just yeah, except it's for that, Orthodox yeah. Jews, Jews have this amongst the lowest birth rates in the world, well, right? Because what's well, I'll tell you something a, interesting, which is that uh, the only one of the uh, industrialized countries that has a fairly solid birth. Uh, rate is if that's the if that's the term um, fertility rate may be more accurate is uh, Israel and yeah. it's not the Orthodox and it's not the oh, Arab Israeli really? citizens secular Jews in Israel reproduce uh, and it, that would be oh, a, an interesting show just in itself oh, I mean secular Jews in Israel reproduce is it is it some sense of mission is it some sense of a nation in the earlier mm. sense as we discussed uh, it, it's a child-oriented country. You probably know if you've been there. Uh, it, it, but but and, but you know when when you have young you know the young are expected to serve uh, in the armed forces and so forth. So uh, it's not an easy matter. But um, it's a it's a very unusual situation. They're an outlier in that. My understanding is the the very orthodox are reproducing to a great extent, but the secular Jews of Israel, who are very secular, are. Um, are reproducing at you know maybe double or more the rate of countries like South Korea and and even the United States has plummeted so very very odd mm. yeah I've noticed uh, Elon before he bought Twitter has been talking about the declining birth rates and this is going to lead to the extinction of humanity I guess he's doing his share I guess he has nine or ten he years. Is, he has <laughs> I think he has more than a dozen I, I I'm not certain of the number yeah you know yeah, that's, it's that's uh, crazy. Yeah. Okay. Here's another thread in your book. I took some notes on here, uh, and I wanted to ask you about why certain themes seem to cluster together. I call this a cluster of heterodoxy, or maybe you called it that. So you you start off with your anti-war uh, and anti-militarist pacifist, but also anti-racism, anti-capitalism, anti-colonialism, well, anti-abuse of capitalism, I guess, anti-apartheid, anti-power of the state, pro-labor, pro the rights of minorities individual liberties on matters such as abortion and gender, anti-segregation. Why do those things all hold together? I'm fond of saying, you know, if I know your position on abortion, I know your position on gun rights and immigration and all these other issues. How could that possibly be? These are separate issues. Well, that's a fascinating question. And you, you may recall in the book, I have a chapter where I sort of trace the history in North America, at least, of, of pacifism. And, you know, going all the way back, the Quakers were known for their enlightened views and behavior toward uh, Native Americans, uh, toward um, escaped slaves, or just not holding slaves. Generally, there were some Quakers who held held slaves, but in general, they were uh, leaders in um, um, trying to improve the lot of Black Americans and get rid of slavery and uh, all of that. So you're you're absolutely right that that these things these things did go together. Uh, they, uh, uh, I mentioned that, you know, pacifists were uh, better educated than uh, most Americans. And um, uh, this was a, this is a package of, of, of views that have gone together, you know, in, in, in this country since before it was a, a country. Um, and um, on the other hand, there are some areas that where there are 
great differences. I mean, in fact, even in World War II, something like, so, as I recall, something like three quarters of Quakers who were uh, eligible for the draft went into the armed forces. Uh, the Mennonites, it was very different. Um, with respect to the role of government, there are some, some very uh, big differences uh, with respect to abortion. Uh, you know, I think that it's, um, I, I think that uh, certain ideas about justice, uh, such as avoid harm, uh, you know, uh, right away they encompass a whole a whole set of things. Let's not shoot anybody. Let's not enslave anybody. Let's not wrongly take away somebody's. You know, let's not wrongly displace anybody. Whatever. So, so it, there is a logic if you look at it through the lens of harm reduction. You know, uh, the rights of animals. Uh, it may be more recently uh, have have come into that portfolio, shall we say? Um, but when you when you uh, when you, it's easy to make assumptions. We would have made assumptions about free speech. Who would be in favor of unfettered free speech? Who would be who would be wanting to restrict uh, certain publications or certain comments? A lot of uh, there's been a lot of side switching about about some of these matters. You know, so I don't think you can you can carry this too you can carry this too far. But I do think that our pacifists uh, during World War II were on the right side of many, many issues then and later. Uh, and I would, I would say, you know, I, I uh, probably agree with them about many things, but I'm not a, I'm not a socialist. Uh, I think capitalism is terrific, and uh, they were largely wrong about it. And um, uh, that just seems to be something that goes with the package, you know? Uh, were were so, they, or was it more of the kind of abuses of capitalism, uh, you know, like uh, uh, cheap labor and yeah, and and uh, sure. sweatshops and things like that? Yeah. No, I think that I think most of them would identify as as socialists. I think Dorothy Day might not have uh, Dwight McDonald, Bayard Rustin, Dellinger, and many many of the others either were were socialists without religion or were Christian socialists, or if not Christian communists, you know. Um, they, um, I mean, it's, it's, it takes a back seat because starting, uh, in World War II, there was such an economic boom in the United States that extended right through the Vietnam period. Um, and, and the, the economy was stimulated, uh, um, unfortunately by war to a great extent. I, I, I don't mean to say unfortunately exactly, but it's not how you want to see it happen. Um, and so I think that, um, there, there was, there's always been tremendous hostility toward business, toward the idea of profit, toward all of these things uh, on the left. I don't think it's, it's, it's well considered personally, uh, but, but it's obviously people have different, different views about, about these things. And um, um, they, they would have preferred, if anything, my folks were more uh, in the anarchist vein. You know, I think they would have preferred employee-owned factories and farms. In fact, another thing we didn't even touch on is the extent to which the pacifists played a role in the movement toward intentional communities, which again has a long American history, but they formed ashrams and they formed communes. And they, David Dellinger, after the war, lived in rural New Jersey with a bunch of other uh, families, uh, quite uncomfortably, I might add, if evidently for all parties. Uh, <laughs> But there was an important uh, such community in Ohio, Ahimsa, that played an early role in the civil rights movement. There was a Harlem ashram. Dellinger and some of the other Union theologians um, uh, had uh, theological students had an ashram in Newark. They had the Newark ashram. So um, in any case, um, there are many, uh, uh, many strands of modernity that you can, modern American life you can see sort of running through these, these folks. Interesting, right? So this uh, kind of underlying moral values that you hold as kind of fundamental principles, like do no harm, don't harm other people, uh, would explain then, say, that the left's recent uh, kind of censoriousness about speech. Yeah. Whereas it, the, it used harm. to be the left was all in favor of free speech. They're the ones yeah. who pioneered free speech in yeah. the '60s, and so on. So, but if you really believe that speech can harm people then you should yeah. be censorious about it. That, that's what, if you place harm as the highest 
you know, harm reduction as the ab as an as an absolute value above all others and 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 superseded by none on any occasion. Well, you can justify anything, right? I mean, you know, I used to 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 try to explain some of this to my student when I had a, I taught a writing class, and I I I I was talking about you know deontology and consequentialism and so on. I said, you know, well, imagine. You know, we talk about, well, what's best? The greatest good for the greatest number. Yeah, everyone agrees. Well, okay, well, I'm walking down. You know, let's say that you're all on a class trip and, you know, there's an accident and the bus turns over and every one of you needs an organ. You know this example, probably every one of them needs an organ. You need a heart, you need a liver, you need lungs and so on. And I'm walking down the street outside the hospital and some of the staff comes out with baseball bats and hits me over the head, drags me inside, harvests all my organs and saves all of your lives. Did they do right? And so people, all of a sudden, the greatest good for the greatest number is not invoked. And people start <laughs> right. people are thinking, right. gee, well, no. And I said, well, why? Why is it wrong to drag me in off the street in that way using baseball bats to beat my brains in uh, uh, and, and subdue me? And, um, you know, well, maybe because be there's practical reasons and there's moral reasons. And we, again, we have the duality. On the, if that's going to happen mm -hmm. all the time, well, I'm going to carry a gun. Right. And so then nobody <laughs> does that. Funny, uh, I saw a funny uh, gif on Twitter yesterday of of uh, applying the trolley problem, as you just described it, to yes. uh, 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 Rawls's veil of ignorance. So the veil of ignorance of the trolley problem, you don't know which one you're going to be. The person pulling right. the trolley handle, driving the trolley, right. you're on the track as part of the five that are right. going to die, or you're the one. So right. what kind of world do you want? Well, you don't want a world where you, you might get bonked on the head and you might be the one to have to give your organs. Uh, you, you know, and so... Eric, <laughs> Eric Hoffer, the great uh, mm. longshoreman philosopher, talked about this sort of thing. And he, he used to, when he talked about work and the nature of work, he would say, you know, the, the worst, he, he wanted a manager who just worked in order to buy toys. He said, the worst <laughs> thing in the world is to work for someone or be ruled by somebody who who was motivated by your your own good because nobody was more ruthless and nobody was more dangerous and mm. uh there's a lot of wisdom eric hoffer is not fashionable now there's a lot of wisdom there and um i think that um uh we've got to be we've got to be careful about about uh taking anything to absolute extremes including including harm reduction because there are mm -hmm. other imperatives there are the moral and political imperatives so mm -hmm. right interesting all right daniel we're coming up on uh two hours here that was a great conversation <laughs> wow that was fantastic thank you so much <laughs> no it's good really uh, there's well there's a lot of there's a lot of meat in your book uh, that thank applies you. to history to uh, current current events and so on that kind of puts it in perspective all right what's your next uh research writing project well, it's a great question. I do have a, you know, I have published novels and I, 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 uh, now that I'm, now that my 40th birthday is approaching, I, um, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't look at, I don't look at, do I? You know, neither do you. Right. Uh, as I, uh, as the years pile up, I, I think maybe another novel might be in order. And, um, I have some, some different ideas about that. This book took a lot of work. It was, it was years. And, um, uh, you know how remunerative book writing is, and so, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna okay, probably do something even less remunerative. Final question: If you were gonna give yeah. advice to a young social activist, you know, people have a, a strong moral sense of right and wrong. They want to make the world a better place. Civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, all been done. I want to get out there and do something. Well, what kind of recommendation do you would you give youngsters today? That is a great question, and. Um, I have very specific, narrow recommendations. I'm a father. I'm blessed to be a father. Uh, you know, the simplest thing, one of the simplest things I would say is talk to people everywhere you go. Get away from your screen, get out into the world and talk to people. You would be very surprised. You very rarely will regret it. I've done it all my life. I still do it wherever I go in bars and so on. I've learned a lot. And uh, uh, But more broadly speaking, I have a bias. I mean, I'm an old news hound and we had a certain culture. We were we never uh, achieved it fully. Obviously, it was always something we 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 tried to be fair. We tried to be impartial. There's no such thing as objective, all well and good. But we had a certain culture, and I would say that to ask yourself if there's a way to invest yourself in informing people, and uh, I I I'm not sure 
how that is done on any or, or, or what way might be scalable. But, uh, you know, when you do that, it, it, it implicit is a certain trust, a certain optimism. I think in, in, in implicit in, in the journalism that we practiced at the great newspapers way back when was the idea that, that you could trust the people. You could trust the voters. You tell them, try to tell them what's going on and um, don't try to tell them what to think about it. Obviously, uh, every word you write is, um, we can go down that road, it's a whole different conversation. But uh, if you could try to uh, engage in truth seeking in some manner, truth seeking and truth disseminating, you might be able to do more good than by any other means. And then maybe I that's with that. old idealism yeah. speaking, but that, that I would agree be... with that. One, one last quick question I just thought of yeah. as an old news, newspaper man. Are you worried about the current status of media or news, local newspapers all going out of business, the <sighs> wow. economic incentives on, uh, for social media are massive to be divisive I, and fake news and all this? I, I, I'm not worried, I'm grieving. I mean, where? <laughs> There's nothing left yeah. to worry about. I'm, I'm like we're saying I'm I'm worried about a corpse. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, obviously a few great newspapers persist, including the Wall Street Journal, for which I, uh, to which I've been contributing uh, for many years, and which treats me very well, and which has wonderful people. But um, all of that said, I uh, it's all I can do, honestly, not to be, uh, you know, uh, in the Hasidic tradition and probably in many other religious traditions, my understanding is that you know despair is a sin. And um, so I try to avoid sin. And so uh, I'm not going to uh, sit here and uh, lament, but I do think that we have, we have lost a very important flywheel in our culture, in our political culture, and in our, in our culture generally. And um, um, uh, I, I know it didn't always exist, but it did exist for a while. There was bad thing. There were bad things about it, like everything. You know, it's like the almighty dollar. You know, you may not appreciate it until it's gone. When it's gone, <laughs> you'll really wish you yeah. had it. Yeah, yeah. If you were Elon Musk and you bought Twitter, would you uh, would you reinstate President Trump? <laughs> Uh, on no, it's just a tough question. I, I certainly would. I certainly would try to move it in a direction of um, a more principled system. Uh, you can't just put anything out there. I don't think anybody can do that. I don't think Twitter, Twitter can do that. But you have to operate on some on some on some set of principles. They have to be universally applied. Uh, you know, I mean, we believe in the rule of law in life. I just it's just absurd that we're going. I mean, the, the, again, you you can't you can't just allow a, a personal preferences or 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 uh uh the, the rising tide of of empathy to uh, uh uh pull you in all directions at the same time you have to you have to operate on some principle basis i think musk himself should just shut up for a while he, he would help his own cause <laughs> yes. if he did he's an extraordinary figure an absolutely incredible figure in every possible respect we can't begin to do justice in in this conversation but uh, uh, I don't uh, think that, uh, given the role that Twitter has, that we can lightly expel uh, people or suppress ideas on it. We we did so, and I think it was a mistake. I don't know if you saw any of the Twitter threads that uh, Barry Weiss and Matt Taibbi have been posting. One yesterday from Barry, uh, who's a strong supporter of Israel, points out, you know, how how conflicted the inner sanctum was at Twitter about whether they should kick Trump off or not. Then ultimately they decide to kick him off. Meanwhile, there's the Ayatollah Khomeini saying, Hey, Israel should be wiped off the map because you know, we don't like Jews and that's posted on Twitter. It's like, okay. Yeah. So yeah. about some but consistency we, here, you know, Amazon, Amazon will throw off a book about some hot topic or other. And if you search Mein Kampf, you'll find it's there. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> so again, if, if you're not going to operate on some principled basis, you know, then then you're there's just not going to be any um, uh, legitimacy and any respect and and any peace and and uh, and that's why <laughs> that's why we have laws and so on and so hopefully <laughs> mm -hmm. that will be discovered. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I didn't invent mm -hmm. these systems. You know, it would mm -hmm. be better if we had two or three twitters. I really I really think it would. It would yeah. be better if we had twenty or thirty, perhaps. You know just as it was better when we had a lot of newspapers and maybe they were attached mm -hmm. to places, you know? So, but the world changes and um, very rarely does it pay attention to what I think. So, uh, <laughs> uh, 
So I feel I the same that. way. Right. <laughs> who am Michael, I to say? Who cares what I think? <laughs> what a great All right, Daniel, that's, conversation that's has been. That's a great place to end it. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I'm so grateful to you, to you for taking the time and for reading and, and for talking.